Yeah, money can't buy you happiness, but it can buy you the best boat that you can have the time of your life in. You know. Yeah, it's true. Okay, so I had a couple of little things. Some um, some you learn through experience, and um, um, and some things with what the Bible says. So, and I've got a few examples for you too. So, I'm just going to turn to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs 30 verse 7. This is um, by um, Agor, a chap called Agor. Uh, no one knows much about him, he, but his name implies that he was some kind of gatherer or, or collector. So that's all that's known about him. And he said, two things have I required of thee, deny me them not before I die, remove far from me vanity and lice, and give me neither poverty nor riches, feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full, and deny thee and say, who is the Lord, or lest I be poor, and steal and take the name of my God in vain. So a balance. I think... I think when we look at the whole thing logically, you know, um, it's really a balance, a balance of life. You know, it's consistency, it's, it's quality of life. And it's not necessarily, it doesn't have a dollar value. Um, I learned that when I got sick. Um, came down with viral pneumonia, got sick for a long time, and I thought it wouldn't matter if I had 10 million in the bank. It doesn't matter because when you're sick, you can't do anything, you know. So, uh, I just thought it's nice to have a balance, and I think that's what this, this proverb was all about. So just in Matthew chapter 21, um, <laughs> there's, just, there's just the coffee machine going off. It's all, uh, um, so Jesus, it says here, and Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And, and he said to them, it is written, my house should be called the house of prayer, but, but you've made it in, into a, a den of thieves. And then he goes on to say, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. So the ministry of Christ was certainly not about the dollar. You know, he was betrayed by Judas and it was all about the money. Obviously, Judas had his eyes on uh, something else in life, that, you know, what life had to offer in this world. And he betrayed the Christ. And um, I, think, I don't think anybody expects us to be walking around with uh, holes in the soles of our shoes or anything like that. But it, it becomes evident when you look at some practical examples in life about how people went from rags to riches. So I, I mentioned Pele, was you there Sunday night? And Pastor Chaz knew all about it. You know, that Hurricane Hilda, um, ex-boxer and all this. And he knew all about this Pele. He was a, a young Brazilian lad who came out of poverty, had no money for shoes, um, very impoverished. Um, his father was a soccer player and got injured and... So mum didn't want Pelé to play soccer, but he became the world's greatest soccer player. Everybody knows Pelé or Ronaldo. And um, he, he took Brazil to three World Cup premierships in 1958, 1962 and 1970. And I think he, um, he scored 12 goals in the World Cup and I think a thousand goals in like professional soccer. So he was a somebody really special that I think the bottom line is he had a love for the game and and they parents couldn't stop that and the other the other one was uh, I, I spoke on Rolls Royce you know uh, F Frederick Henry Royce and he was he came from a very impoverished background um, mum and dad went bankrupt they were running a flour mill or something and he was and his dad died when he was very young. 
So he was expected to go to work, and I, I know by the age of 15 he'd completed only one year of um, education. But he had this desire to be a professional engineer and um, started a business at 22 and, you know, self-educated, basically, and um, put a lot of hours in doing all sorts of different work, starting and apprenticeships and failing halfway through because of lack of financial support. And he became um, part of the Rolls-Royce story, which, which is still going on. The legacy continues. And I'm thinking, it wasn't money that got him where he was, you know. It wasn't, it wasn't that side of things. In fact, I think at times too much money is a, is a distraction. And um, they come out, all these folk, they come out of these really impoverished background. Another one, Vincent van Gogh. He's, um, he was a professional tennis player. No, he wasn't. He was a, he was a, <laughs> he was a, he was a painter um, from the Netherlands. And um, we, we're following um, a young lady, a harpist um, from the Netherlands who she, she plays the harp, the um, Starry, Starry Night by Don McLean. You know that song? Yeah, I won't sing it. And, um, but she takes you around where Van Gogh um, lived and painted and all that. It was really quite fantastic, actually. But if you know his story, of, I mean, so as tragic as it was, because he died at 37 years of age, without ever knowing that his paintings would become the most famous paintings in the world, so much so that one of his paintings, I think, sold at an auction for 57 or $53 million. That was in 1990. Um, the sadness is that his father was a, I think he was a Protestant minister, and Vincent went into the, you know, went into the church and tried to sort of get involved. He ended up getting um, disillusioned by the whole thing and went out as an evangelist. I think he went over to uh, Belgium in the mines and gave all his money away to, to find out what true Christianity was all about. It's much like, you know, you do. You know, you, you're young and you think, oh, I'm going to go overseas and preach the gospel and everything's going to be wonderful. And, 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 but with him, he came back very disillusioned from the whole thing. He was basically excommunicated from his church. And he went into painting as a, as a, as a way of trying to sort of gain his soul back, um, only to become this incredibly famous painter, you know. So, so you and I lay our lives down to serve the Lord. And there's nothing, there's no financial gain. Believe me, <laughs> there is no financial gain. <laughs> so, um, but, but, when the Lord says, you know, you, you put these aside, you put your life aside to serve me, your family, your friends, your, you know, your culture, whatever it is, and serve the Lord. He said, I'll, I'll bless you. I'll bless your lives. And that's, that's true. That side of it's true. He said, I'll keep you in health even as your soul prospers. And that's very important as you get older. You know, you need to be healthy. I'm still working. It gets harder and I have to pray every day just to get out of bed. <laughs> but, um, but anyhow, we'll go to another scripture. It says, you know, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil, which uh, while some covered it after, they have erred from the truth or the, from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So... It can be a real distraction money from salvation, from your identity with the Lord. It affects your soul. So Proverbs chapter 8, verse 12. It's gone very quiet out there. You, you, all the way. It's a, it's a bit different. It's different for me doing this sort of thing. I'm, I'm normally working, so... Um, so verse 12 it says I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge with witty inventions the fear of the Lord is to hate evil pride and arrogancy and an evil way and the froward mouth do I hate counsel is mine and sound wisdom I am understanding I have strength 
It says, By me kings reign and princes decree justice, and by me princes rule and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Riches and honour are with me, yea, durable riches and righteousness. And my fruit is better than gold, yea, uh, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. I lead the way in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of judgment. And it says that I may cause those that love me, it's talking about wisdom here, to inherit substance and I will fill their treasures. And I, I just think, wow, that's something out of the Bible says in Proverbs also, it says, wisdom crieth out without and she uttereth her voice in the streets. And I thought if you want to be rich, if you want to and feel or um, the riches of God, then we need we need wisdom, because wisdom is able to bring out many things. And um, and Proverbs also goes on to say, it says, how much better is it to get wisdom than gold, and to get understanding rather than to be uh, rather to be chosen than f silver? And I, I just think about Solomon's dream. You know, when he he was asking the Lord. Give me understanding, give me wisdom that I might rule your people wisely. And the Lord says, not only will I give you that, but I'll give you all the riches. Because you didn't ask for him. You said, I'll give you a long life and I'll give you health. Um, but he gave him this incredible wisdom. And I think that's, that's where we are, that's who we are. You know, first you seek the kingdom of God and, and then you, you let the Lord do the rest. You know, I was only saying to Julie this morning, um, sort of um, dealing with exotic woods um, for musical instruments, the price of woods um, has gone through the roof. And I thought, say you're a, you know, say you're a carpenter and you, you're a tradie and you're doing incredibly well and uh, you're working six days a week as the contractors do and, you, you know, you've got your vestment homes and you've got all the stuff and one day the wood runs out. Well, what do you do, you know? And um, I think to, to go that way in life, to devote yourself too much to, you know, the riches of this life can be very, very dangerous. Whereas the riches of God are forever. They'll secure your soul for the eternities. So, and the Lord will add unto you, you know, um, believe it or not, I, I never thought, I, it's only when I got sick, I had the time to build a harp. It was quite bizarre, actually. In hospital, Julie brought the plans in. I'm, I'm, I'm in isolation and I've got all the plans all over the place and doctors come around and say, what are you doing, you know? And I said, I need a hammer and a hacksaw. And um, anyhow, they, um, they said, yeah, you can go home if you promise not to go back to work. So just build your heart, you know, otherwise you stay in here in isolation. So, so you don't know what's around the corner. You don't know what's possible in your life. You know, you stop serving yourself and serving this world and you serve the Lord. Who knows who you can or what you can achieve in this life? And uh, so you don't know what's within. You know, only the Lord's able to bring that talent out in, in your life. And uh, it's, it's amazing, you know, I thought, why would I build a harp, you know? Wow, I never thought I'd do that, you know. And all I had was, at the time, I said it was a hammer, screwdriver, hacksaw and I borrowed stuff and you know it we're just making the head of the thing or the neck it took me three goes and it was all hand done and I'm thinking this is crazy and someone's just asked me to build a harp and I just thought no it's because it takes thousands of hours you know but uh, anyhow anyhow we have some fun but um so there is just one little thing I want to finish on and it's, it's, we've all been in the Lord a number of years, and it's cool, it's good, it's become a way of life, it's, you know, it's, it's cosy, it's easy, uh, we all know each other, um, we go down camp and it's, it's just such a nice place and we've got our buildings and everything's done, you know, you just walk in and get your coffee and it's just wonderful. And then we have our different events and, and we have prayer and fast and um, I mean I'm, I'm guilty when, when, when looking at this aspect of fasting um, so I'll just turn to Isaiah 58 verse 6 um, 
it, it talks about fasting. And um, without going into it too, too much, um, the Lord's saying when we fast, he said, is, this, is not this the fast that I have chosen? He said, you fast for different things. You might be fight, you know, worried about this or worried about this, worried about your finances. What are you going to do? And what are you going to do when you retire and all that sort of stuff? Or when you retire, do you think, how am I going to survive? And cost of living's going up and all that sort of thing. And, uh, and you, you're getting worried and, and you come and, and you have this prayer and fast. You think, oh, I know how to solve this. And, uh, and, and you, you get involved with all the things that are going wrong in your life at the time, all your needs. And he said, is this, is this acceptable before the Lord? And um, the Lord's saying in verse 6, is, it, is, is not this the fast that I've chosen, to loose the bands of wickedness? And we're in a wicked world. You, you and I know this is a, a wicked world. You know, everything that's out there and... You know, you tell me if you can find one politician that's straight, you know. And um, they say, you know, how, how, can, how do you know if a politician's on the level? And it's when the dribble comes out both sides. <laughs> but, um, but it's a hard job. There was a lot of pressure on those people trying to run this country. It's very hard. They're up, they're trying to, anyone that's trying to do the right thing out there, it's very, very difficult for them. So I don't envy their positions. And, I guess the Bible says we've got to pray for our uh, ministers, you know, our, you know, our governors and what have you. Um, but it says to, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free, that, we, um, that you break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that they cover him, and thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. And, uh, and, he, then, and he goes on to say, and I'm thinking, who is the fatherless? Who is the widow? Who is the naked? And I thought, it's those that are lost, basically, those without salvation, I believe. And he said, if you do this, it says, then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily. And thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy Re reward. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. And if thou take away, um, and, and, and thou take away from the, in the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and the speaking vanity, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, and it goes on. It's just beautiful. It's just everything we dream about, you know. You know, how many of you are just so frustrated? And you think, well, why isn't this happening? You know, I'm praying about it, I've fasted about it, I, I need this in my life. And, and the Lord's saying, well, hang on, hang on. This, we, we've got a job for you. We want you to do this job. And it doesn't have to be hard. You know, I'm not the Mr. Doorknocker, outreacher guy. I, I have to do it where I feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, as probably that's mainly my, one of the reasons why I still run a business because I can be out there, part of the crowd, and I just speak it out, you know. So, so, and it's opportunity, isn't it? We have a calling, and I thought just by looking at this, the rewards are such that it brings huge reward. You know, you, you re-establish your relationship with the Lord, you re-establish your health, you re-establish all your financial needs. And I thought, this is prospering in the Lord. When you, you give it over to the Lord and you just say, well, I'll, I'll just serve you. And, it, and it, it doesn't have to be hard. I mean, this thing we're doing down at camp, it's just taken off. And, and it's almost like there's some of the folk are so excited. And I just thought to myself, we haven't even started organising it yet, you know, and... Uh, so there's an event coming up, and, in, and you're, it's, it's, it's for you, you know, Zone 4 Camp's coming, and we're, I don't know if you've heard that they've, I don't know what actually they call it, like a, they're trying to tr create this dark zone so for star observation, and uh, we're all doing a little bit to try and um, promote that.
but we're going to have a lot of fun. So having our star presentation and a walk around, you know, it'll probably be rainy and cloudy. Who knows at the night? You know, bit of a bit of a miniature orchestra. You know, me and Greg are going to sing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. And and you know what? It's got to be fun. You know, you, you, I don't want to go round feeling like because I've been told to do something, I have to do it. I want to do it because I want to do it. And and things can really happen. I, I went into Lawrence and Hanson the other day, and I've got this thing on my mind, because I'm ringing up some of the musicians saying, what can you do in five minutes notice? Because how long we got about the end of August? Anyhow, um, so I go into this electrical suppliers, and I said to the guy, would you come to Karakalinga under the stars? And he's a young guy. And uh, he goes, oh, my parents live there. And uh, he said, you know the house that the truck went through? You know the one as you come down the hill? Yeah, you know that one? And I said, you know what? I'd be planting six bollards at the front of that place. And he said, you know what? We've told mum and dad that. And he said, you know what they've done? They've put the front, the, the main bedroom at the front of the house. And I thought, oh, you know. <laughs> so, and I said, so would you come? And he goes, yeah, I'd come. And... Um, and, and uh, I went from there and I had to ring up a brother who, who deals with electrical and I said, oh, do you ever go to Lawrence and Hanson? He goes, yeah, I was there yesterday. And I said, I just talked to a guy at the front. Oh, yeah, Dan. And I said, that's the one. And I thought, I've already got my follow-up. I've already got somebody else involved. And it's just because my mind wasn't on everything else. You know, like, I was just on trying to do something for the Lord and bang, bang, bang. And I thought... That is not a coincidence, is it? You know, and, and what we need to be is, is first you seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and, and all these things will be added unto you. You know, you, you, your lives are set in the Lord. You're called out of all this rubbish. Because life, we've got one opportunity here to make the most of life and the Holy Spirit that we've been given and to make a difference. You know, unfortunately for Vincent van Gogh, he didn't know about his fame. He, he never lived that long to, to find out. And he was disillusioned by the whole, whole of life. But his paintings were marvellous, you know. And, and you may not think you, you're making any difference, but the Lord sees it, you know. And you get, you get down. You think, well, what's the point? You know, I'm just, I haven't got nothing to really contribute. But you have. You've been faithfully following the Lord for all this time. And it's just brilliant. You know, I mean, if I brought somebody new, I have to bring them somewhere to a group of people who are following the Lord. And as, and as soon as you bring them in, they see the difference. They see the difference. You, you're not drinking, you're not smoking, you're not swearing and yet you're all happy, and you've got this common interest, you've got this love for the Word of God. And that's where it's going gonna, it's gonna to take you to places you've never been before. Try the eternities in, in a short while. You know, it talks about being transformed in, in a twinkling of an eye. Try that for a health thing, you know. So, oh, I'm going to live forever. Where would you get pills for that? And I said, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Holy Spirit, nothing less. Baptised, you know. But um, there you go. Um, you're doing really well. A great future. I'm, Julie and I are really privileged to be here now. So it's taken, it's been a long time. We're back where we come from. <laughs> so I remember the early days building this joint. But um, this is, we were down in this section, hand digging foundations with Phil Caffrey. Phil Caffrey was going through cancer at the time. Who's the, who's the old lady that was... was Barbara. Remember Barbara? She used to drive a scooter and my kids thought she was the postie, but she, was, she used to drive too quick, yeah. But she was down here and uh, Pastor John, somebody else. But we were digging this on our own. And I said, where is everybody, you know? And Pastor John says, don't worry about everybody else. Just, just enjoy the people that are here. And I just thought, that's it. You know, if we are, if we are um, 
willing to serve the Lord and put our lives aside, it makes a difference when we have uh, fellowship. And it's, look what you've got today. You know, it started off a little tiny thing over here, and it just grew and grew, you know. And uh, at the time, we thought, what do we need this building for? You know, it's massive, but it's, it's going to be too small soon, you know. And uh, we completed the, the golf course. That's the first stage is complete. And you think, well, why do we need 5.4 acres of land? Well, God knows. And Pastor Godfrey said to me, how big are you going to do the, the, uh, the hall? And I said, oh, council regulations, no more than 150. Oh, he goes, 500, Pastor Tony. 500 people, no less. <laughs> and I thought, that's right for you. And he says, he said, you build a church, the people will come, you know. Actually, that's, not, that's the wrong accent, isn't it? Yeah, so. <laughs> I think that's a bit of South African, bit of Irish in there, yeah. So, uh, actually, Roslyn, the lady that came to the Lord, um, she's one-third Afghan, one-third Aboriginal, and one-third Irish. And she's got the worst of all the three already. <laughs> but she came to the Lord and received the Holy Spirit. And she's a sister in the Lord. And uh, it's just fantastic to meet these people who you would never have any association. It's a real privilege to these to meet, meet these people that have come from a totally different culture and all that. So God's got plans for you. Just keep serving the Lord and don't worry about the money side of things so much. I know some, some of you it's really tough. But the Lord's promises are yea and amen. He can't go back on his word. But your part is to serve him. So where possible, just, just say hello to somebody. and You know, just say, come to a stars night. Come and hear Pastor Tony sing, you know. And they'll walk out straight away. <laughs> but anyhow, um, sometimes people will come to things that um, we've probably done a thousand times. But I think it's your enthusiasm, I do believe. I think, it's, I think they see when, when the lights go on in your life, when you, you push it all aside, all the stuff that you've got to deal with, there's a time for all that, and there's a time to serve the Lord. And now it's the time to serve the Lord. I'd, I just wish you well, but it's good for your health, it's good for your soul, it's, it's good to be around people that are enthusiastic. I've come here and it's fabulous. I'm starting to organise something, and all of a sudden it's all done. And I thought, boy, I've got nothing to do. You know? <laughs> but, it's, um, but it's good to be around folk that really want to get involved and see things happen. So um, thank you for putting up me for the last half an hour. But So I'll get back to my cold latte. So over to you, Brendan. Thank you very much.